I'm going to speak to you today from one word, one word, and that word is surrounded, surrounded. Um, but first, I want to send greetings from my husband, who is in California. Um, so he says hi. I think he's watching now. He's watching now, so I'm going to wave to him. Hi, hon. Love you. Um, but so he sends his greetings and love to you this morning. And um, you know that he preached at Angelus Temple, the Dream Center, the Church of the Dream Center on Thursday. Amazing place, amazing ministry that we support, and um, he did an awesome job. God used him on Thursday to preach the word. You could still watch it if you, if you missed it. It's, um, you have to look under Angelus Temple um, on Facebook, so if you want to see that word. But um, God, God is doing a new thing. Um, God is, is, is on the move. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's get started with our word today. Surrounded. Surrounded. One word God gave me was surrounded and then this song was popular a few years back so all i could do was go around the house singing the song <laughs> um so the word surrounded it means to be all around someone or something some similar words or synonyms to the word surrounded are near adjacent bordering encircling and encompassing. Psalm 125, 1 to 2 says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. Verse 2 says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Amen? Amen. God's word is amazing. Um, last week... Pastor Evan was here, and he uh, spoke from Psalm 73, and he read that whole psalm, and then there was a, a verse right at the end of it that he said, this is the main verse, and he said, if you could take anything today, this is what I want you to take away, and it was at the end of Psalm 73, it was Psalm 73, verse 28, and it said, but as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. And so, being near, God is near. Amen? He's more near than we'll ever know, or that we can ever imagine, because he surrounds us. We're encircled by God, his presence. Amen? And so, last week he said, if you can take anything with you, know that God is near. God is near. Even when we don't see it or feel it, he is near. So today's message is going to springboard off of that. And, and it's amazing how God does that, right? But, you know, it's just continuing in the same vein. Well, I didn't talk to him about what he was preaching about. He didn't talk to me what God gave me. But God, this is definitely going to springboard off of that. God is near. Amen. In fact, we're surrounded by his presence. Amen. If that makes you joyful, say amen. amen. <laughs> so sometimes you find yourself questioning God. Do you ever? Okay, I've been saved now since I was a little girl, so 40, 40 plus years. Okay. And, um, you know, I've had the joy of the Lord in my heart for a very long time, but there came a point during COVID. The, when it was really on the rise, you know, when it first happened three years ago, this month, right, started March 2020, this month and last month, was boom, it hit us, right? We didn't see that coming, right? But boom, like a punch, right? So COVID happened and we all felt it, we all went through it. And, you know, we were going, we were, we were staying home, we were isolated and all this, but loved ones were going in the hospital. People from our church, loved ones, family members, we got calls every day, pray for this, pray for that. We went online doing prayer services, praise and worship and prayer. And, you know, I had lost my mother in 2019, December of 2019, and then three months later, my father goes in for COVID to the hospital. But we lost Gloria Rose. We lost sweet Gloria Rose, Rose's mom. Um, sorry, <laughs> Joan's mom, Joan's mom. Um, sweet Gloria Rose. We lost her. We lost Sister Naomi, precious friend of the church for many years, one of my very good friends. 
Um, and other, we were praying for other church members. We were praying, for, my husband had double pneumonia. And by the grace of God, that's a whole other testimony I won't get into today, but he made it by a, a hair by not going into the hospital. Okay? That's a whole other testimony behind that one. But then my father goes in. Now he was at my house, he was visiting me. And when we just started hearing, oh, people are getting sick. Oh, what's happening? What's happening? And he went in. He left my house. And a few days later, he's in the hospital. And then a day later, they're like, he can't breathe. We had to put him on a ventilator. OK. So we're like, he's 77 years old. This was two years ago. And we say, OK, get him on the ventilator. Um, but, and at the same time, his brother, my father's older brother, who's 10 years older than him, was, they were in the same hospital. They didn't even know it. My father's brother ends up passing away. Naomi passed away. Gloria Rose passed away. And there was just, just death was around us, was surrounding us, right? And so all this is going on, and, you know, I'm trying to keep the faith, you know, we're all trying to keep the faith, right? Remember this time we were trying to praise him and press through. But there comes a time when you just wrestle with God and say, what are you doing? <laughs> What's going on? And you question, right? Now, not that I question his faithfulness and things like that, but I found myself just done because what happened was, well, a mighty miracle happened. My father, was it was Good Friday 2020, and they told us, get ready, because Monday we got to prepare because he's not going to make it. We have to take him off this ventilator. He's not improving. So my siblings and I said, can we just have the holy weekend to pray? because we've been praying. <laughs> the doctors thought we were crazy, but they said, okay. So we prayed, and then um, Monday, oh, uh, Saturday, Saturday they called, and they said, um, hmm, a respiratory therapist is in there working with him because he's showing some signs of improvement. Okay, so we started, you know, so the therapist was there. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Maybe something's happening, okay? But it was like, an impo it was impossible because his numbers... Whatever these machines are, I didn't get it, but <laughs> was way too high. And I asked the doctor, so what has to happen for it to for him to for you to say no, we can, you know, he said it has to go, the number has to go down really low. So the next day the numbers were going psh, down on this peep machine. I, is anybody here doctors? I don't know. I don't understand all the stuff. I still don't understand it. But anyway, my sister Sarah goes, I'm gonna pray that peep down. <laughs> she said that machine down. So the numbers go down start going down, and so they call and say, okay. And so then Sunday morning, the doctor, my sister was the one, um, she knows, she's good with all this medical stuff, so he was calling her a lot. And, and the doctor said to my sister, well, um, happy Easter, your dad is off the ventilator and he's breathing on his own, okay? So that was, that was amazing, right? Okay, that was amazing. Now, so all this is great, we're rejoicing, we're celebrating, but there's still a lot of stuff going on. Okay, so then five days later, that was April 12th, 2020, Sunday, Easter morning. Now, five days later was my birthday, April 17th. We got a call again from the doctor. The doctors um, called my sister. It was bad news. And he said, listen, um, you know, he's struggling to breathe on his own again, and we're going to have to put him back on. We're going to have to put him back on, so what do you want to do? Do you want to? Do you, you know, we were left with this decision. So she calls me in a panic. What am I going to do? I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I said, okay, Julie, just calm down for a second. Okay, just for a second, let's pray. First thing, let's pray. We have to pray. So we're praying. We're praying. We're praying. We're, that's all we've been doing this whole <laughs> COVID time was praying. So we got used to this praying all day, all day, every day, praying and travailing and all of this, okay, so I said, look, let's just sit, with, let's just, they give, they, they're, they're telling us by tonight, okay, so let's just pray, you know, so then we go, um, and at, at the beginning of this, I said to my sister, we're going to be like the persistent widow, and we're not going to give up, and so she took that with her, and she, and she says, okay, persistence, persistence, we kept praying, and so that night, um, so, okay, after I'm off the phone call with my sister, I go upstairs, and I say, I want to be alone with God, and I said, I'm going to have a talk with God. <laughs> and so I get into the attic where nobody is, and I fall on my knees, and I start, it was almost like, felt like I was wrestling with God. Like, God, what are you doing? Like, you had this mighty miracle, and everything, we thought everything was going to be okay, and now what? 
now he's going to die again? Like, this is playing with my emotions, God. You know, I was being real with God, you know? I just had that moment where I just was, like, questioning God. Now, in deep inside of me, I knew that he's faithful. I know that he's faithful. I know that. I know that. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's faithful. But I found myself questioning him. And I found myself saying, God, this situation seems beyond repair. My back is against the wall. I'm tired of this. Please do something. Are you going to do something? Are you going to let this happen? It was like questions and questions and questions and questions. Are you there? Knock on the ceiling. God, what happened there? What did you do? You raised him on Easter and now you're doing what? It, it was so confusing to me. So I found myself questioning God. But inside I heard, hold on. Just hold on. Hold on. Hold on. And he gave me that scripture, uh, I'm not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man that I should change my mind. Do I not promise? Do I not speak and then act? Do I not promise and then fulfill? And I kept thinking of that. And I kept, um, and then, so I went downstairs and I had that wrestle battle with God. But something inside me knew that I couldn't give up still. So we question God, but we know, deep inside, we know he is God. God is God. God is God. (laughs) He's amazing God. So, I went downstairs and something, a couple things happened. Um, my husband had noticed that I was, my husband had noticed that I was like really, like I had been through a fight, <laughs> like I had been through a battle. He noticed that like, he said to me, he said, you know what, I, can I just, I just want to give you a hug. So I remember this, this is some, well, you know, you take those things, you take those things out that you remember you'll never forget. Just, I'm going to give you a hug right now. I'm going to give you a really strong hug. So he gave me like this really strong hug as I've ever felt. And he said, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. He said, I just felt something. He said, I felt the compassion of the Lord come through me, Rachel, and went right to you. He said, I never felt that before. It was like a compassion of the Lord downloaded in him to hold me in an embrace. And so my husband was that tangible thing, but it was the Lord who was embracing me, surrounding me with his arms and his love because God is compassionate. He knows what we're going through, and he's a compassionate God, but he's got it. He's got this. God's got it. And so he wanted to just wrap me in his arms with, and show me that he saw what I was going through. And he had compassion, but that I just had to trust him. And then I went downstairs, and I also read, um, took the Jesus Calling book on that day. And it was, uh, Jesus Calling, it was on my birthday, April 17th. And, the, and th- the thing said, it said this, it said, don't let unexpected things throw you off course. <laughs> and it said, that scripture, it also said in there, they will have no fear of bad news. The heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. And he said, I'm training you in steadiness. So that, you know, after having that battle with God and that wrestling and then come downstairs, and my husband gave me a compassion hug from God. And then, and then the, the, Jesus calling, God was speaking to me. God was surrounding me. Even though it looked like the enemy had me surrounded. God was surrounding those things that were surrounding me. Amen? And so that's just a little testimony about that. I remember that so vividly. And we have things in our life that sometimes seem so beyond repair, beyond repair and insurmountable. But God says, I I see and I have compassion, but I've, I've got it. You've got to trust me. You've got to trust me. Amen. Psalm, let me remind you that the Bible says from Psalm 139, 5 through 10, and I, I've been, I've, I like the good news, I go around with different translations, so I do have some good news translation in here. I have NLT, NIV, sorry, it's just the way I like to flip flop, but I don't know if they have good news, so they have the NLT up there, but Psalm 139, 5 to 10, you are all around me on every side. You protect me with your power. Your knowledge of me is too deep. It's beyond my understanding. Where could I go from you? Where could I get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. 
If I lay down in the world of the dead, you would be there. If I flew away beyond the east or lived in the farthest place of the west, you would be there to lead me. You would be there to help me. God is near. God is near. God surrounds us. He's more near than we could ever, ever, ever imagine. He sees everything. He knows everything. We may not be in control, but God is. God is. The word of the Lord says, God, he surrounds us both now and forevermore. So when he's near, he's always near. God hasn't left. He, hasn't, he doesn't leave us or forsake us. The Bible says he never leaves us or forsakes us. He's always near. So once he surrounds us, he's always surrounding us. God hasn't fallen, as, fallen asleep on your issues, on your problems, on your troubles. He never slumbers or sleeps. God is a God of compassion and love. Christians are not exempt from the realities of this world, are we? <laughs> I wish I could say that, but we live in a sin-stained world. We are sinners ourselves. We come to Jesus, and we're saved, and we're washed in the blood, but we still sin. And the world, it's, it's, a, it's a sinful world. And we live in the sin-stained world, so we are going to have problems. We are going to have challenges. We are going to have struggles. It's part of our life. But you know what? God uses that. This is how good God is. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So we, the enemy means it for harm. But what happens? God turns it around for good. God turns it around for good. So what the enemy means for harm, God will turn around for good. God's got us. God's got us. But we're not exempt from it. But we have to realize that God, you know, sometimes he, he'll orchestrate the situation in our life to cause us to push, push through to him, to seek his face. And he'll allow those things in order for us to get on our knees and to seek his face and to say, where are you, God? Oh, I look up. I look up to the hills for where does my help come from? It comes from you, Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It causes us to look up these things that happen in our life, and he'll orchestrate it in such a way that it's pushing us toward him. Amen? Amen. Have you ever been through something? Amen. As long as we have flesh on our bones, we're going to be going through some stuff. Amen? So maybe today you feel surrounded by life situations that seem insurmountable. Maybe you're surrounded by little things here and there, little challenges here and there, right? Something, something we've, at some point in life, some challenge comes up. Has anyone ever been challenged? Raise your hand, because you're all acting like, oh, no, you know, I don't know. Have you been challenged? Okay, we go through challenges, we go through things. All right, and sometimes they just feel like everything is, the walls are closing in on us, right? But when we're children of God, he surrounds those things that surround us. So maybe you feel surrounded by family issues, by relational issues, by financial issues, by worries, by fears, by troubles, by low self-worth, and by guilt, sin, temptations. You're surrounded by these things and worries. But when we know Christ, he surrounds those things that surround you. And in his presence, God surrounds us. His presence surrounds us. In his presence, no matter what we're going through, in his presence, the Bible says, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy in his presence. Amen? Amen to that. So the, the word of God says from Psalm 32, 7, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble and you surround me with songs of deliverance. He surrounds us. Romans 8, 31, in view of all this, what can we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Think of that scripture. If God is for us, that little scripture. If God is for us, come on, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who sits on the throne up high, who's with us, who lives in us, who surrounds us, the God who made the stars, put the stars in place, the heavens, the moons, the universe is with us. If God is with us, who 
can be against us. If God is with you, Diane, who can be against you? If God is with you, Minda, who can be against you? No one. Amen? No one. He's the God who sits on the throne. Amen? So today I want to get into a little portion of scripture about Elisha going on with the same thing. Elisha found himself in a battle, 2 Kings chapter 6, okay? And we're going to learn from this portion of our text of the scripture today how to implement some strategies when we feel surrounded by troubles and issues. Because we are. We, we, we sometimes feel, and the enemy's on attack. Look, as long as we're saved, we're going to be, we're going to get a, a, a left punch, a right punch from the enemy, right? But now, I'm not talking about, you know, there's people that, are, oh, everything's an attack of the enemy, attack, attack, I'm attacked, I'm attacked, I'm attacked, I'm attacked. <laughs> but, the, you know, uh, uh, oh, my cholesterol's through the roof. Well, why do you think your cholesterol's through the roof? Because you eat fried food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Oh, it's the enemy, the enemy's attacking me, the enemy's attacking me, the enemy's attacking, me. attacking, attacking. Okay, I'm not talking about that, okay? <laughs> but, you know, some things we bring upon ourselves, fine. But let me be rest assured, when the day of evil comes, the Bible says, Okay? We have an enemy. We have a real enemy who does attack us, our minds, and brings, you know, wants to destroy us. He has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But God wants to give us life and life more abundantly, right? So let's, let's not, I mean, he is a real, this is, you know, this is a, the Bible says we fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight. It's a battle. Right? But we got to keep the faith. Amen? So let's look at 2 Kings 6, 8 through 16. Also, again, I did it in the good news just because I like some wording in it. You'll see why. But it says, um, the Syrian army is defeated. This is 8 through 16. The king of Syria was at war with Israel. He consulted his officers and chose a place to set up his camp. But Elisha sent a word to the king of Israel, warning him not to go near that place because the Syrians were waiting and ambushed there. So the king of Israel warned the people who lived in that place, and they were on guard. This happened several times. The Syrian king became greatly upset over this, and he called his officers, and he asked them, which one of you is on the side of the king of Israel? One of them answered, no one is, your majesty. The prophet Elisha tells the king of Israel what you say, even in the privacy of your own room. Find out where he is, the king ordered, and I'll capture him. When he was told that Elisha was in Dothan, he sent a large force there with horses and chariots. They reached the town at night and surrounded it. Early the next morning, Elisha's servant got up, went out of the house, and saw the Syrian troops with their horses and chariots surrounding the town. He went back to Elisha, and he exclaimed, We're doomed, sir. What shall we do? Don't be afraid. Elisha answered, we have more on our side than they have on theirs. And then he prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord answered his prayer, and Elisha's servant looked up, and he saw the hillside covered with horses and chariots of fire all around. Fire represents the presence of God. We have more on our side than they have on theirs. Amen? Amen. 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 So strategy number one, be on guard. Let's go back to verses 9 and 10. Remember, the enemy comes. He'll, he'll, he'll try and come and ambush you, but God knows all about it. He can't do anything without God knowing, right? So let's go back to verses 9 and 10. But Elisha sent a word to the king of Israel, warning him not to go near that place. So he was, he, the, the, king of, uh, uh, the king of Syria was planning sneak attacks. You know, we're going to go ambush them. So, but they were always finding out. They were finding out. It's like, what? And so the king of Syria is like, who's a traitor here? Who's telling, you know? No, no, uh, there's, a, there's a prophet who God speaks to him of what you say in your bedroom. All right? So <laughs> the enemy can't in, in sneak attack us. Ambush, God knows. Amen? And so the king of Israel warned the people who lived in that place, and they were on guard. This happened several times. It's going to happen throughout our Christian life. 
we're going to have those attacks. But we can be on guard. Turn to your neighbor and say, on guard. On guard. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, 4 says, For though we live in a world, we do not, we live in the world, but we do not wage war like the world does. The weapons we fight with, we don't use weapons of the world. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen. There's more with us than there is with them. The Bible says to be alert, be awake, be on guard. That's strategy number one. First Peter 5, 8 to 9 says, be on your guard and stay awake. Your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion sneaking around for someone to attack. But you must resist the devil and stay strong in your faith. Keep the faith. You know that all over the world, the Lord's followers are suffering just as you. James 4, 7 says, so then submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, Jesus said, told us to keep watch and pr pray. He told his disciples when they fell asleep. He said, keep watch and pray in Matthew 26, 41. Keep watch and pray and you will not fall into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So we're to stay vigilant. We're to stay alert. We're to stay awake. Are you awake this morning? Are you on guard this morning? Yes? Okay. We're to stay awake. We're to stay on guard. We're to keep worshiped up, keep praised up, keep prayed up. Stay awake. Stay alert. Stay alert. Don't fall asleep. Be on guard. They were on guard and they, they moved when the enemy was coming into attack. Strategy number two, which is from verse 15 and 16 of Elisha's story in 2 Kings, is don't be afraid. Early the next morning, verse 15, Elisha's servant got up. He went out of the house, and he saw the Syrian troops with their horses and chariots surrounding the town. He went back to Elisha, and he exclaimed, We're doomed, sir! I could just picture it. We're doomed! What shall we do? And Elisha said calmly, Don't be afraid. Elisha answered, We have more on our side than they have on theirs. So you gotta keep the faith, you gotta keep believing, you gotta keep trusting, you gotta keep fighting the good fight of faith. In 2 Timothy 6, 12, we fight the good fight of faith. No enemy can de defeat us when God is on our side. If God is for us, who can be against us? When God is on our side, he surrounds those things that surround us. Amen. Now's not the time to quit. Now's not the time to give up. I love that. Um, that uh, Bible study we did back with Mark Batterson. We're doing another one. Please join the Bible study with Mark Batterson. It's real, it was really good. The circle maker, the circle maker where you circle your prayers, again, in circling. Um, don't give up. One thing he said that I'll never forget from that, that thing, it's stuck with me. I say it all the time. You're one prayer short of your miracle. So don't give up. The lady with the, in the Bible um, with the issue of blood, with the hemorrhage for 12 years, could have given up. She could have given up. She went to doctors upon doctors upon doctors. And you know what the, doc you know what the Bible says about her? It says her problem didn't get better. It got worse. That's what I found myself when my father came off the ventilator after 17 days. It was glorious, but then what? Now he's back. Now he's bad again? It got worse? What? What's happening? Don't give up. Don't give up. Her problem got worse. She had been to doctors for 12 years, but her problem didn't get any better. It, in fact, it got worse. And so, she, but she didn't give up. She heard Jesus was coming, and she had to touch the hem of his garment, and she was healed. She kept the faith. Even though it was 12 years of a battle, 12 years of a struggle, she didn't give up. She didn't give up. She was one prayer short of a miracle. And she touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. Amen. So we're fighting that good fight of faith. Oh, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Uh, the, um, and you know what? We're fighting this good fight of faith, but the Bible says that God fights our battles, right? He fights our battles from Exodus 14, 14. Said, the, Lord's, the Lord himself will fight for you. 
just stay calm. Isn't that what Elisha did? He stayed calm, didn't he? Didn't look like he said, oh, yeah, we're doomed, you're right. Nope, he stayed calm. Elisha was able to stay calm, okay? But let's not, let's not judge the servant too much, okay? <laughs> All right? Elisha was able to stay calm, okay? But the servant got all up in a panic. We do that. We do that. So let's not judge. Let's not judge our friend, the servant of Elisha, there for a second. Yes. But wouldn't it be good? Wouldn't it be good if we can stay calm? If we can stay calm, right? And just know that God is fighting our battles. You got to know that God is fighting your battle. And I, I feel like that's for somebody right now. God wants you to know stay calm. That's all you need to do. He is fighting that battle. He's fighting that battle. Amen, somebody. Give me an amen. 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 Okay. Psalm 124, 1 to 3 says, The Lord, if the Lord had not been on our side, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The Bible also says, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, we are pressed on every side by troubles, right? On every side. Sometimes we feel like the walls are closing in and we got attacks on every side of us. But we're not crushed. We're perplexed. I'm questioning God like, what, God? Uh, I am perplexed. What are you doing? But we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but we're never abandoned by God. This is a powerful scripture, isn't it? We're never abandoned by God. He surrounds us. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And we get back up. Yes, we're not destroyed. So don't be afraid. We have more on our side than the enemy has on his. Amen? The Bible tells us that the angels encamp around us. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Psalm 34, 7, in the message, I like the way it puts it, the angel sets up a circle of protection around us while we pray. Just envision that. I'm very much a visual person when I read these things. I can envision these scenarios in my head and I can just envision the angels, just like a circle of angels surrounding Amen? Strategy three, are you still with me? Are you still with me? You sure? Okay. Amen. 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 Strategy three is ask God to open our eyes. Open our eyes and so that we can see. There's a, pi a bigger picture here. There's a much bigger picture than what you can see. A much bigger picture. So we got to trust God. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Uh, verse 17 said, Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, when he looked up, you see, those circumstances that push us, God orchestr orchestrates circumstances that will push up, push us to look up. He looked up, and he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. They weren't just horses and chariots like the enemy had. They were horses and chariots of fire. Fire means the presence of God. Amen. Amen. We need to pray that God would open our eyes to the spiritual realm. There's a much bigger picture here than what you see in the natural. We need to sharpen our sense of spiritual sight. And I think this um, Bible study is going to be really good because it's our spiritual senses. Do we hear God? We got to ask him to open our eyes. Open our eyes, open our ears, and sharpen our spiritual senses. Amen? Because in the spiritual realm, realm the situation is already taken care of. I might not be in control, but God is, God is, and if God is for me, who can be against me? Amen. If we, we could pray like Elijah, 
that God would give us spiritual eyes to see. Imagine we prayed like Elisha, give me spiritual eyes to see, and then God granted that request like he did the servant, and then we could see everything that's going on, and we could see that we have more for us than are against us, and our spiritual eyes can be, see this, we'd have a lot less fear and anxiety, fears and anxieties, right? Amen. Well, we can ask the Lord to give us spiritual eyes to see that those horses and chariots of fire, fire, the fire of God is around us, the presence of God. The Bible says that weeping might endure for a night, Psalm 35, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. And that was strategy. That was strategy number three. Open our eyes. Oh, Lord, open our eyes. Give us spiritual eyes to see. Give us some spiritual eyes to see, Lord, that the, this is much bigger. It's much bigger, and you're taking care of it, Lord. You surround those things that surround us. So now we're going to go to um, strategy four. Strategy four is something that the Lord said, add this, because this is very important. I want you to add this. So it's not taken from the Elisha story, but something I feel is very, very important in battle. Praise through your battles. Praise through your battles. Amen. Now, sometimes that's easier said than it is done, right? Sometimes we're right through the battle, through the thick of it. Do we feel like praising God? Well, it's a sacrifice. The Bible says it's a sacrifice. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. Praise is a Praise is a weapon that we can use, those spiritual weapons that we can use in spite of how we feel. Okay, it's a sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Though Jesus, therefore, let us, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Now, today is Palm Sunday, isn't it? It's Palm Sunday, so fits right in with the sermon. Palm Sunday, amen. Jesus rode on a donkey to Jerusalem before his crucifixion, and he was riding in, and the people were praising him, right? And they were laying their cloaks down, you know, praising him. Hosanna to God in the highest. Luke 19, 37 to 40, when he came near the place where the road goes near the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice, loud voices for all the miracles that had been see they had seen. Verse 38, blessed is the king, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And verse 40 is great. He says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Somebody's going to praise God. All right? So we can praise him through our battle continually bring to God the sacrifice of praise. Say, why do I need to praise him in my battle? Why do I need to praise him in my battle? You know what? It pushes back the enemy. The enemy flees. God is pushing back the darkness as you praise him. Oh, how do you know that? Well, the Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us so. So praise puts the focus on God, right? It puts the focus on God. And it shifts our perspective then to see that our help really does come from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 121, 1 says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. There's, a, there's a, just a couple more stories quick that I want to tell you regarding this, but one of my very favorite, favorite um, scenarios, you know, stories in the Bible is, uh, it is uh, in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were put in prison, and they were beaten. They were put in jail, they were beaten. Um, I think this is one of the most amazing stories. I love it every time. But they, they were beaten, they were put in chains, stocks on their uh, feet, and hands, and they were chained, and they had just got done being beaten, okay? So here they are. They're going into jail. They go into jail. Do you feel like praising God after something like that happens? Mmm. But it says in the midnight hour, sometimes it's in the midnight hour where we get our breakthrough. Amen? Don't give up. 
You're one prayer short of your miracle. Well, at the midnight hour, they started praying and singing hymns to God. Praying and singing hymns to God as they were in chains with blood and wounds. And they're praying and singing praises. What happens? The doors flew open. The earthquake, an earthquake shook the prison to its foundation. The doors flew open. The chains fell off. The jailer was about to kill himself and said, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in trouble. I must have just killed myself. Paul said, no, 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 we're still here. And so the jailer said, oh my goodness. The jailer sees all this going on. And he's like, what must I do to be saved? Oh, like something's happening here. And so Paul says, to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. He goes to his house, he preaches to his family, they get saved, they get baptized, and this is the part that really that I love the most. The jailer then washes his wounds. Okay? Okay. This is what God said to me in here. When we praise, we praise during our battles, during those open wounds, God washes our wounds. When we praise, when we can praise him in the midst of a battle, he washes those wounds that you feel, those open scars, those open wounds. And it's like he puts a wet, warm blanket and cleans us and washes every wound that you feel through that battle, through that, through that challenge, that time that you feel in your life, that you're going through something that feels beyond repair. And you can still praise him, like Paul and Silas, he washes your wounds. Amen. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God that we serve. Amen. Okay, so hallelujah. There's one more short little, come up, uh, Miss Genesis, uh, for some worship. Yeah, just play. Just play the, the guitar in the back because I'm coming to a close. But we had the story of um, Jehoshaphat in the Bible. Um, and th back in the Old Testament, this was another thing I found that was kind of, uh, kind of like cool, you know? Here he is, Je King Jehoshaphat, and he was told that uh, the army is ready to come in and attack you. Okay, so what does he do? He starts praying and he starts asking for guidance, okay? This is King Jehoshaphat. And he heard that someone was coming to attack, the army was coming to attack. He asked the Lord for guidance and he called, you know what he did? <laughs> when an army is coming to attack you, do the first thing you think of without doing is singing? No, <laughs> right? But the army, he was told, was coming to attack him, and he said he called the musicians. And he said, you know, he had prayed, he asked God for guidance, and this is what God told him. He said, you know, he called the musicians to march ahead of the army and sing praises to God and sing praises to God. 2 Chronicles 20, 21 to 24. It says, after consulting with the people, the king ordered some musicians to put the robes on what they wore on sacred occasions and to march ahead of the army singing, praise the Lord, his love is eternal. So here a battle is happening. Someone's coming to attack him. And he says, let's march out and let's sing praises to God. Those were the orders. And so that's what they do. So praise the Lord, his love is eternal. They sang that to the Lord. And verse 22 says, When they began to sing, the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. So when we can praise through our battles, the enemy goes into a panic. Amen? When we can praise through those battles, we put the enemy in a panic. Right? Okay, so then it says, verse 23, The Ammonites and the Moabites attacked the Edomite army and completely destroyed it. And they turned on each other in savage fighting. Verse 24, when the Judean army reached a tower that was in the desert, they looked toward the enemy and they saw they were all lying on the ground. Dead. No one escaped. Why is that? Because they decided to praise the Lord in their battles. They decided to praise the Lord, even though they were being attacked. So when you praise the Lord, it pushes back the darkness. The enemy is left dead on the ground. He's left dead on the ground. When you can praise God through the pain, praise him through the battle, 
We knock the enemy out. He knocks the enemy out. You say, but how do you know this? Well, I just showed you a couple things, and all through the Bible, you can find stories. You can find story after story after story how God comes through. Or we can just praise him. It pushes back the darkness. Amen to that. You know, we can praise God not just with singing, but we can praise him with our lips. We can praise him with our words. We can praise him with a verse. We can, we can praise him. We can just start thanking him. Praise and see, praise and thanksgiving goes together. Praise and thanksgiving is together. And so we give thanks to God. So yes, you're going through a battle. You're going through something that seems insurmountable. But you know what? Start thanking him like God to be what you know he is, his attributes. And Lord, what you need him to be in that situation. God, I need you to be my rescuer. The Bible says you are my rescuer. God, I need you to rescue me out of this situation. God, the Bible says you are my hiding place. You always surround me with songs of deliverance, God. And bring those scriptures up and say, God, the Bible says you are faithful. You are faithful. You are not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you change your mind. You are consistent. You are consistent. You are faithful. The Bible says you never change, God. You never change change God just start talking to him and thanking him for all of his attributes that's a way to praise him and just say oh Jesus Christ he's the same today yesterday and forever he remains the same every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights he doesn't change like the shifting shadows God you never change people are change people are fickle people will be this way one day and that way the next day people have moods up here people have moods down there we all do but God is consistent God is consistent he does not change just for that we can praise him we can praise him we can trust him because he doesn't change we don't put our trust in man man changes his mind but God does not change and for that I give you praise God God is faithful think of the times think of the times that he has come through for you in the past and just start praising him for that and say, so you're in the midst of a battle. You're in the midst of a battle. But you're like, God, I remember that time. I remember that time where I was in a deep dumps of depression. And you took me, Lord, and you brought me to the altar in church that day. And you lifted me out of the pits of despair and depression. Oh, God, I remember that, God. And if you can do it for me then, you can do it for me again, God. And you just start praising him that way. You start praising him by remembering the things that he's done before because he will do it again. He will do it again. God is able to do more than we ask, that we could think, or that we could ever imagine. So take those scriptures, songs, sing, put on the music, put on the music. I like this music in the background. You know when, 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 when Saul was tormented, Saul was tormented by the evil spirits, what happened? What happened to make those evil spirits go? David came and played the harp. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does that say? Praise is a weapon. And you know what? Praise is a strong weapon. It's a very strong weapon. Don't forget it. Say, oh, I don't feel like I don't feel like praising. I'm, I'm, I, this is insurmountable. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, everything's surrounding me on every side. Get up and praise the Lord. Amen. Because if we don't, the rocks will cry. The rocks. And there's no rock going to cry in my place. He's faithful. He is faithful. What he's done, he'd do it again. Amen. He's a faithful God. Um, amen. Give him some praise. That's right, church. Give him praise. Clap to him. Clap to him. Give him a, 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 an offering of praise. Hallelujah. God, you are faithful. God, you never change. God, you don't fail me. God, you never fail me, and you're not going to fail me now. You've never failed me, and I know you won't fail me now. God, this problem, I see it, is horrible, but I trust you. But I trust you. I trust you. I put all my faith and all my trust in you and you alone. The, Lord, the Bible says, those who trust the Lord are blessed. Those who trust the Lord are blessed. 
It's about trust. It's about trust. And when you can praise him, you see, when that, you put on, these are different things. I'm giving you some different practical things to do. The Bible tells us we can do. It's not just about singing. It's, it's, we, we can take a scripture. We can take a scripture. And we can say, God, what, what is a scripture? This is what I did. I said, well, usually God will just give you a scripture anyway. But I said, what, what do you want? What, through this circumstance, Lord, what is a scripture that I can, I can just repeat? I can put on repeat and I can just continually to say that's going to help me through this. And so God will give you a scripture when you ask him. Or sometimes he just gives you a scripture without even asking. So during the COVID time, right before COVID hit, God gave me a scripture before that I kept, uh, I kept um, meditating on. And I kept saying it, I kept saying it, I kept saying it. There's something about just repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating his word that does something, that changes things in the atmosphere. And the simple scripture was from Luke 137, for with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. And for, he gave me that before, like right around the time COVID was about to hit. I was like, I got I to gotta meditate on this scripture. I got to meditate on this scripture. And I just kept saying, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. For with God, I love the amplified version, for with God, nothing is or ever shall be, or ever shall be, or ever shall be impossible. And I needed that scripture. It was a, like a lifeline during that whole time of COVID and everybody going out. But I knew I had to stand on his word and praise him and thank him that, Lord, thank you. Thank you that when it looks impossible in the natural, it looks at what's, what's impossible for man is possible for God. Amen? I thank you. So just start Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving and praise and songs. Put on the music. Even if you don't know how to sing, who cares? <laughs> sing to your favorite praise songs. I can put a praise song on and I can sing it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and I can, I can put that thing on repeat till I'm blue in the face because it just does something to the atmosphere. It does something. It, God washes our wounds and the enemy flees. Amen. And another scripture he gave me through that time, through that time of COVID where everything just seemed insurmountable was, is from the message version. It's Psalm 18, 16. And it says, the hand of God has turned the tide. The hand of God is raised in victory. The hand of God has turned the tide. And then you just start praising him, God, you're going to turn the tide in this situation. God, you're going to turn it around. Oh, God, I trust you. You're going to turn this situation around. And those were, those were the two battle plan scriptures. Get your battle plan scriptures. And another thing that God, that God tells us is to put on that full armor of God. Put on that full armor of God in Ephesians 6. That's part of the battle, too. We need to be covered and head to toe because when the day of evil comes, and it will come, we need, to be, we need to be prayed up, praised up. We need to be on guard, have that, have that spiritual armor on, have it on fully, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, everything, because the day of evil will come, but the four strategies are to be on guard to, uh, to, uh, what was the second one? <laughs> don't, don't be afraid, thank you. <laughs> be on guard, don't be afraid. Um, goodness, I should have wrote them down here. <laughs> ah, you're listening. <laughs> be on guard, don't be afraid. Open our eyes and praise through the battles. And praise through the battles, amen, amen. So part of that being on guard is putting on that spiritual armor as well. We need to be geared up because that enemy will come and attack and we will go through situations as long as we have flesh on these bones, okay? We will go through things. But he surrounds those things that surround us. And there's more on our side than there are on theirs.